practicing the biblical principles of what a church should be and manifesting the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Hour of Faith, originating from the sanctuary of the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. As you participate in today's broadcast, may the Lord challenge your heart with the word. by radio, television, the World Wide Web, and however else you might be joining in as we come to you from the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, the United States of America. And we've just had that opportunity of singing that song, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. And I trust that you can say that in your life wherever you might be today. Some of you may know that in the better part of the last two weeks, I've been out of the country uh, over in the land of India and uh, just returned Friday afternoon and uh, had a great time of fellowship over there with one of the missionaries from the Way of Truth Baptist Mission and that of course was Sonny Abraham and his wife Manchu and uh, just a great time of fellowship and uh, that fella, Sonny Abraham, knows how to keep American preachers busy and uh, the whole time we were doing something, and if there wasn't something to do, uh, we found something to do. But it was a great time of fellowship, and just to be able to uh, speak to them, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, speak at the college there for three days in a row, and then, of course, on Sunday last week, had the opportunity of doing something I've never done. I've done it, but not together. I had a baptism. I had a baby dedication, I had an ordination, and then I preached and had something to say to every one of them. And uh, it was a busy day when I got back to the hotel uh, on Sunday afternoon. It was a, it, I enjoyed rest. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's great to visit the mission field and to see how God is at work. And uh, flying back, I had a 14-hour and 55-minute flight in the airplane and uh, sat down beside a person I got in the plane. I said, where are you headed to? He was an Indian. I said, where are you headed to? He says, I'm headed back home. I said, where's back home? He said, Pittsburgh. And that was all the way from Bombay, India. And uh, he said he wanted to go to uh, Washington, D.C. to see the, um, the uh, cherry blossoms this spring, but he couldn't because he had to go back to India to get married. And, uh, you know, they prearranged their marriages. So he went back and married his wife, and she was there. First time she was ever on an airplane was coming back from India, 14 hours and 55 minutes. 
That's a long flight for the first time you're ever in an airplane. But at a good time of fellowship with him, he worked for Uber Technologies in Pittsburgh. And he is one who's developing Uber cars to drive themselves. So uh, we had an interesting discussion. But I, I, I know that many of you know that I was gone. I want to thank you very, very much for your prayers. And I will tell you that the believers in India are strong and well. Even some of them have very difficult things to face. Um, there's persecution in the land of India. Uh, but they are strong for the Lord. And I just say, to God be the glory. But anyway, it's a delight to have you there by the radio, television, the computer, your telephone, however you're joining us. And if we can ever minister to you spiritually, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our contact information is there on the screen. You can see it. And uh, our goal is that you know Christ. Do you? The Bible says we've all sinned and have come short to the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you've not yet trusted Christ, call upon him and be saved, which means to be delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. I do want to uh, just mention to you from the word of God, from Psalm 86, something that... Uh, we ought to all rejoice in where it says in verse 7 and following, In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto your works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God and God alone. And truly he is. And I trust that wherever you might be today, that you will recognize how great God is and that you will worship him and recognize him as God and God alone and give him the honor and the, and the glory and the praise that's due his name. I just want to make one announcement to those of you joining us by Media Ministries, and that is coming up on Thursday, May the 30th, we are going to be having the Pensacola Christian College Proclaim Ministry team with us. Uh, they uh, will be sharing God's word through message and song. And I don't know if this can be picked up uh, on that uh, camera or not. Uh, but there you can see a little bit of it as they're zooming in. If I could hold the thing straight. And uh, it's a quartet of five, as you can see there. And uh, they are going to be here singing for us on the evening of May the 30th at 7 o'clock. And uh, we would invite each and every one of you to come out and come out and bring your young people and your older people and your middle-aged people as we gather together for a great night of music. And uh, that will be the Pensacola Christian College Proclaim Ministry Team on uh, May the 30th here at the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona and we would love to have you to be involved. Come on out. If you have any questions about it, give us a call here at the Faith Baptist Church and again those uh, contact info, pieces of contact information you can see on the screen but particularly the phone number is 814-944-2894. That's 814-944-2894. Well, we've had the opportunity of singing to God be the glory. and We've talked about how God is the God of majesty and to be exalted. But aren't you thankful for God's faithfulness? Well, we're going to sing about it. And it's in our hymn book number uh, 26. And we invite you to sing along with us at home as we stand here in the congregation and sing that great hymn of the faith. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand as the instruments begin to play, please.
that that song led you in worship. I hope also you enjoyed it. Uh, you know, sometimes I think we as Baptists don't enjoy the Lord. Uh, the Bible talks about joy and, and, and blessing and rejoicing, and we sort of come to church, you know, oh. <laughs> but you see, we are to enjoy the things of the Lord, and I trust that you enjoyed that as well, is that it led you into worshiping the Lord. I, last week uh, over in uh, India, and maybe Sonny and Manchu are watching because I know they, they do watch. And uh, they were telling me last week they saw my dad on the TV and thought that he looked strong. And I told him that the other day and he said, well, looks deceive. <laughs> but, uh, you know, last week over there in Sonny and Manchu's church, uh, after I baptized people, the, the, they, the, the, the congregation bursted out in singing. And, you know, it was just an enjoyable thing to hear that. And they enjoy their Christianity, even though some of them are facing certain elements of persecution. And so uh, let's pledge allegiance to our Lamb, Jesus Christ, all right? And give Him the praise and adore Him for who He is and what He's done. If you have a copy of God's Word, please turn with me to Romans chapter 15 this morning. The 15th chapter of the book of Romans. And I've been reading down through this uh, chapter uh, during my time over in India as well as on the airplane coming home. And uh, there's just a lot in this chapter that we could focus on. But I want us to focus on one particular verse. But we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 13 of uh, Romans 15. Did I say Romans 15? Okay. Romans 15, chapter 15, verses 1 through 13. And I invite you to stand out of respect for God and His Word as I read and you follow along. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 13, where the Word of God says, and think about this, church, really think about this. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may, be, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another." as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost." And our key verse to look at today is verse 4, where it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you once again for the opportunity that we have to look into your Word. We thank you, Father, that that has been written has been written for our learning, that through the Scriptures we might have hope. I pray, dear Lord, that you'll guide us in our study and understanding of your Word today, that that hope might overflow in abundance in our lives. And if there's one here without Jesus Christ, it's my prayer that today they will come to know Him, whom to know a right is life eternal and life abundant, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Dr. J. Vernon McGee said many years ago, and it was many years ago because he's been with the Lord for over 30. He said, the greatest sin of the church of Jesus Christ 
is ignorance of the word of God. Let me repeat that. The greatest sin of the church of Jesus Christ is ignorance of the word of God. He goes on to say, many times I will hear a church officer say, I don't know much about the Bible, but my opinion is. Then he gives his opinion, which actually contradicts the word of God. That is a quotation from Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Many of us know of him as a great Bible teacher who, though he's with the Lord, his, his messages are still being preached all across the nation and around the world, maybe to a greater degree than he ever had even when he was alive. But think about that. The greatest sin, according to him, in his opinion, the greatest sin of the church of Jesus Christ is the ignorance of the word of God. I asked myself the question when I read that, how much of the Word of God do I know? Uh, this morning I happened to be watching a, another preacher on TV. And uh, it was Dr. Charles Stanley. And uh, he made this statement. He turned to a verse of Scripture and he says, I'm going to make a confession to you. And I'm going to make a confession to God. I came across a verse of Scripture this past week I never saw before. And he said that is, when you go into a house, every house you go into, you should say, peace be to this house. He said, I've never done that. So I'm making a confession. I'm still learning about what the Bible says. There's a man who studies the Word of God, who's written many, many books on the Bible, preaches and teaches for the Scripture and has done for many years. You know we will never understand all that's in the Bible. You know that, don't you? But we should all have a basic understanding of what the Word of God says. What is your knowledge of God's word today? And I I ask you to pay attention for a few minutes this morning. As we look at this idea of what I am calling the practical value of Scripture, which is to learn with hope. Think about that. The practical value of Scripture, which is to learn with hope. And we're going to look at this great verse of Scripture because it teaches us that everything that God wants us to know is right here. We don't have to operate on opinion. We don't have to operate on I think so. We can operate on what I know so according to God as long as we study his word. So today we're going to look at the purpose of scripture. Then we're going to look at the power of scripture. Then we're going to look at the promise of scripture. First of all, let's look at the purpose of scripture. Verse 4 of Romans 15 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, that is in the past, were written for our learning. What we find in the scripture is written for our learning. Let's consider a moment the aforetime for the Apostle Paul, as well as the aforetime for you and I who live today. And as I was looking at this verse the past couple of days, a thought came to me. Every now and then throughout the scripture, we are told to take a look back. Uh, For instance, in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, God told Joshua to meditate upon the book of the law. Remember that? And that was a look back to what? The Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then you come into this passage of Scripture in uh, Romans 15, where it says that we are to look back to the things that were written the fourth time for our learning. What would that include? All of the books of the Old Testament and perhaps even... Uh, the, um, uh, the Gospels in, in Paul's day. Uh, but then as you go into the book of the Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 3, it says that when we look into the Word of God, that uh, we are blessed to the Lord when we study it, when we read it, when we hear it, and we're not to add anything to it or take away from it. So it's interesting to note that every now and then, uh, it's like the Spirit of God stopped and said, now remember what has been written. And so let's think about that. Let's remember what has been written for our learning. Uh, There are many people, for instance, uh, who will say, well, I don't study much of the Old Testament. I like the New Testament. And then there are some who say, "I, I don't like the Gospels. I like the Epistles. Listen, every one of the 66 books of the Bible should be where we study. It's all written for our learning. But let's look at the aforetime, as it were, first of all, from Paul's perspective. And, you know, today, I am going to give you a 15-point study of the whole Bible. When you leave today, you'll know everything that the Bible says, generally speaking, if you pay attention. 
because we're looking at what has occurred aforetime. Certainly for the Apostle Paul, it was the Old Testament. I want to ask you this morning, how well do you know your Old Testament? How, how many times have you studied the Bible, the verse of Scripture that says, at Parbar westward, to the causeway, and forward Parbar? And do you know where to find it? I know Dr. Chris Davis does because he taught it one morning at men's prayer breakfast. People, I, I, I share that verse and people say, you're making that up. Or you're speaking in Baptist tongues. No, it's in the Bible. And if you miss reading the Chronicles and the chronologies, you'd never see that verse. How well do you know the Old Testament scriptures? It's interesting that as Paul says here, that the things were written the fourth time were written for our learning, what we learn and what Paul would have learned as he, when he was writing to the Romans, looked back into the Old Testament scriptures, all the books of the Old Testament scriptures. What is there to learn? Well, as we look back into the Old Testament scriptures, we learn the power of God as seen in creation, don't we? And when you read Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and you see that, how that it speaks, that God brought this entire universe together. He spoke it into existence without anything that was previously existing. That is power. And so you see, in creation, we learn the power of God. Then you go on, and we learn the standards of God as seen in the fall of man. Remember Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. He told Adam and Eve, he said, I'm going to put you in this garden, and it's a beautiful garden. And you can partake of all the trees of all the fruit in this garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. If you eat of that, you'll die. Well, we know the story how that Satan came along and deceived Eve and even got her to question God. But you see, when they partook, they did die right there on the scene. Not physically. They died later physically, but they died spiritually right there simply because the standard of God was don't sin or our fellowship is broken. And it was. So we learn the standards of God as seen in the fall of man. Number three, as we go on, we learn the grace of God as seen in providing a sacrifice. Isn't it interesting to note that right there in Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 on throughout the end of the chapter, even though Adam and Eve grossly sinned against God, he provided a covering for them right there. Remember that? He took care of them right there, providing a covering for them so that they would not be ashamed. But then in that same passage of Scripture, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God's grace is seen in that that is the first promise of the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So in the midst of the standards of God being broken, we see the grace of God in providing a sacrifice not only for Adam and Eve, but for the sins of the whole world right there in Genesis chapter 3. Then, as we continue, we learn the expectation of God, as seen in Genesis chapter 4 with Abel and Cain. You remember them? Two brothers, uh, and, and they couldn't get along, even way back in those days, in almost a perfect society. You find that uh, brothers would have some difficulties getting along. But you know the situation there, that um, Cain and Abel, as brothers were offering sacrifices. And Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. And when you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, you'll find that what was better about it, in reality, and there's been a lot of discussion, but what was better about it was the fact that, that um, uh, Abel's sacrifice was a sacrifice faith-believing. Whereas Cain's sacrifice was just sort of uh, uh, going through the acts of it. But what happened? We find that God expected true worship. And because God didn't, or because Cain did not give the right worship, and because he killed his brother, uh, Cain was marked for the rest of his life. So we see there the expectation of God, that God desires a right attitude in worship. Then as we go on, we learn the judgment of God as seen in the great Noahic flood. And uh, it, it's amazing that when you come to Genesis chapter 6, you, you find that, that in just a short period of time after creation, 
God looked down upon the world and saw that it was all in sin. And it repented God that he, that he even made mankind. But he did find one man whose name was Noah. And Noah had found grace in the eyes of God. But you see, because of the fact that the whole world, with the exception of Noah and his family, had violated God's word and God's way and God's expectation, God judged the world. Judgment does come in the face of sin. We learn that. That's written for our learning, that we might know how to serve the Lord. Then as we go on, number six, we learn the demands of God as seen in the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 11. Just a short period of time, even after the, the, uh, the flood, we realized that uh, God had said to the people of the earth that they were to multiply and to scatter throughout the face of the earth. Twice God told the people that. He, he told them that right after creation, back in Genesis 1 and 2, and then he told that right after they came out of the flood, that they weren't to stay in one place, but they were to scatter. That was his demands. They were to fill the whole earth. But you remember the days of the Tower of Babel. They decided that they wanted to make a name for themselves, and they decided that they weren't going to obey God and his demands. They were going to stay together and build a great tower to heaven so that they could be united. And what happened? God came down and destroyed the Tower of Babel. What we see there is teaching on the demands of God. God desired worldwide expansion, and the people weren't willing to give it. Then, number seven, we learn the providence of God as seen in Abram's call. There in Genesis chapter 12, he called Abram out of a land that was his into a land that he did not know. And what was God doing there? God was in the process of calling Abraham to be the father of the nation of Israel. And when we read throughout basically the rest of Genesis, we learn about how God blessed Abraham and his seed. And even today, as we see the nation of Israel, we realize that it traces itself back to Genesis chapter 12. And the promise that was given to Abraham, that he would always have a seed, that would always have a nation uh, and, of course, that nation is the nation of Israel. But it was the providence of God that brought that together. And today, even though you've got many, many people trying to destroy the nation of Israel, it will never be destroyed because God brought it together and God's going to keep it together by His grace. That's all of His providence. We learn about that. Then, number eight, we learn the plan of God as seen in His work with Israel. This would basically include the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, as well as the historical books of the Bible. When we read throughout the, the Pentateuch, for instance, we see the deliverance of, of Israel from Egypt. Remember, they were in Egypt for 430 years. God raised up Moses to lead them out. That was him delivering them, taking care of them, so that his promise to Abraham would be able to be kept. Then we see the plan of God through the provision of Israel, even in the wilderness. Think about it. When they were in that wilderness, they were there for how many years? Forty. Their shoes didn't wear out. Goodness, you know, you can get a pair of shoes today, and in, in two weeks they're, they're flat on the bottoms, or whatever the case. But they walked the wilderness for 40 years, and their shoes were still as good as the first day they put them on. And every day, God provided food for them. You see, we see his plan in providing for his people. Then after, the, after the, they came out of the wilderness and crossed over the Jordan River and went into the promised land, as it were, remember that, that Israel was in a great conquest. And in that great conquest of the promised land, they had to fight seven nations that were more powerful and larger than they. Did they defeat those nations? Yes, indeed they did. Because you see, the fact that God's plan was being fulfilled through them and he gave them the strength to do it. But we also learn as we read through the Pentateuch as well as the historical books of the Bible that judgment came upon Israel because of their sin. They were into the uh, Babylonian captivity and um, the Assyrian captivity because they compromised with the world and they brought sin in their lives through the worship of false gods and idols and so forth and so on. And so we see, though, the plan of God coming into fruition for his people in the Pentateuch and the historical books. Then number nine, as we go on, we learn the praise and worship of God in the Psalms. 
You know, we just had the opportunity of several weeks ago having Don um, Wurzen with us, who gave us a seminar on the concept of praise and worship and what it's all about. And, you know, when we read through the Psalms, we would understand what praise and worship is unto God. They were to sing unto the Lord uh, from the heart and, and that we are to use instruments of praise to glorify Him. If we never study through the Psalms, we'll never understand what real praise and worship to God's all about. But those Psalms have been given to us in order to teach us how to worship God. Number 10. By the way, are you enjoying this? You're learning about the Bible today. Hope you're taking some notes. Uh, if not, all of this is online. But I'm trying to remind you that all of this is given to us that we might learn how really to worship God and to live for Him. Number 10, we learn the expression of God to His people. You know, we've talked about the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. We've talked about the, um, the historical books. We've talked about the book of the Psalms. But another division of the Old Testament is the, of the, uh, is the poetry books, such as Psalms. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And in there, we see the beautiful expression and the teaching of God for His people. How much time do you spend uh, studying the Proverbs or, or, the, or the, uh, the, the Psalms or the, the Song of Solomon? There are some tremendous biblical principles to learn in that beautiful poetry that God has put together in expressing Himself to His people. And then finally, number 11, we learn the future of the work of God in the prophecy books. You know, the major prophets and the minor prophets, Isaiah through Malachi. We learn what God's going to do in the future. So many times we say, what is God going to do? You know what? All we need to do is read his book. And we will know. You see, from Paul's perspective, he said these things are written aforetime for our learning. And I just gave you 11 points, an 11-step walk through the Old Testament where we learn the power of God, the standards of God, the grace of God, the expectation of God, the judgment of God, the demands of God, the providence of God, the plan of God, the praise and worship of God, the expression of God, the future work of God. Now tell me you're not glad you came today. You didn't think I could preach through the whole Old Testament in 10 minutes, did you? Neither did I. But you get the point. It's there for our learning that we might know how God works. But that is the aforetime from Paul's perspective. What about the aforetime from our perspective? Well, we have both the Old Testament and the New Testament scriptures. You see, we learn the principles of Christ in the Gospels. You know the synoptics, don't you? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four books teach us the principles by which Christ wants us to live. And so if we never take some time to study them, we'll never know what Christ expects. But when we study the Gospels, we'll learn the principles of Christ to live for His honor and glory. Then, as we go on, we learn the foundations of the church in the book of the Acts, particularly Acts chapter 2 through 28. There we see the church founded, and now the church grew. And now the church, because of the fact that it held the sound doctrine, was able to reach the whole world by the end of the first century. That is amazing to me. Today we can speak to the whole world through radio, television, and the internet, but the only thing they had were wooden boats and, and tired donkeys and camels. And yet they were able to reach the whole world according to Colossians chapter 1. Why? Because they followed and they obeyed God. And if we would just follow and obey God, we would be amazed to see what God would do through us in our churches, in our Christian lives and ministry today. So we see the foundations of the church in Acts. Then we, we learn the instructions for the church in the epistles. That is, the book of Romans through the, Jew, through the book of Jude, including Revelation chapters 1 through 3. I'll put that in there, because Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 uh, speak, chapter 1 is past in the days of the apostles. Chapters 2 and 3 uh, represent where we live today. But the fact of the matter is, we see their instruction for church truth. In other words, it's the epistles that teach us how to live as Christians within the body of Christ. And then, of course, we learn things to come in the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 4 through 22. 
There I gave you 15 points on the whole Bible, all 66 books. You're glad you came today, aren't you? But you see, in the New Testament, we learn the principles of Christ, the foundations of the church, the instructions for church truth, things to come. What is your knowledge of God's word? I ask that question, what is your knowledge of God's word? All of this has been written for our learning. That is the purpose of Scripture. And all that we need to know about God and how to please Him is in His word. I'm thankful for Psalm 119, verse 130, that tells us that the word of God gives us light and understanding to who God is and what God expects. Are you in the word of God? Are you in the Bible? Are you reading it daily? It's been given to you. All of this is written for your learning, for my learning. Why? Well, that leads us to the second point. We go from the purpose of Scripture to the power of Scripture, where it says there in verse 4 of Romans 15, For whatsoever things were written the time were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures... Now stop right there. The power of Scripture is found in those two words, patience and comfort. Let's consider, first of all, the patience of Scripture. The Greek word for patience, as we have it here in our English Bible, is really the Greek word which means that which consistently endures. That which consistently endures. It's not telling us there that the Bible is patient with us. But it is telling us there that the Bible will always endure. Aren't you thankful that you have a book here that you can read that will never pass away? Amen. The truths that are written in this book from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 will be here forever and a, And that gives us power, you see. When we read the Bible, we don't read something that's going to pass away next week. People have been trying to destroy this book for years. But you know the Bible teaches us in the, in the Gospel of Matthew uh, that, uh, uh, that not one jot or tittle will pass from the book of the law till all is fulfilled. That speaks to the two smallest characteristics of the, uh, of the Hebrew alphabet will never fade away till everything this Bible says comes into fruition. And that's for an eternity, by the way. And you see, that's what that word patience means. It means endurance. The power of the word of God is that through the providence of God, it will endure forever and therefore we can depend upon it always. What a book. What a Bible. That's its power. But then it says here, for whatsoever things were written the fourth time were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures. Comfort of the scriptures. The Greek word for comfort here is parakalesis, which means consolation and exhortation. And the power of the word of God is that it consoles us when comfort is needed. Isn't that great? The word of God will console us when we need comfort. You know, we're, we're going through a difficult time and we don't know where to turn and what to do. And then we come across Psalm 46, 1 that says, God is your refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Wow! What comfort that brings. And that's just one of many verses of Scripture. But not only does it give us comfort, the Word of God also exhorts us to action when action and teaching is needed. And sometimes, you know, we wonder what to do, where to turn, what to say, where to go next. And then we come across a verse like Isaiah 40, 31, where it says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's an exhortation for us to wait upon the Lord, to set our face toward God, to get to know His will and do His will and then watch Him work. You see, the power of Scripture is there because of the fact that it will endure forever and that it gives comfort to us in the time of need. As I've shared with you, I've been in India the past couple of Days, and uh, I don't know how many of you get the Voice of the Martyrs magazine, but the current edition of the Voice of the Martyrs magazine came out, and it's all about persecution in India. And the, the cover article reads this way as it begins. Organized public beatings 
of pastors and sexual assaults of their wives and young daughters, poisoning of Christian water supplies, destruction of churches, assassination of church leaders, and burning of the Bibles. This is probably not the idea, uh, this is probably not the India you are familiar with. But it is the India that many of our Indian Christian brothers and sisters, totaling more than 20 million, live in every day. The world's largest democracy has elected officials who publicly subscribe to a dangerous belief that Hindu unity must be achieved through the purification that is the removal by force of everything and everyone that is not Hindu. The intolerance of the Hindu unity movement is equaled only by that of radical Islam. But in the face of the fact that there are people in India who want to wipe out Christianity, the Christians over there are strong. They're witnessing. They're doing daily evangelism. Every day they're out there. Why? Because of the patience. That is the endurance and the comfort of scriptures. It encourages them to keep on keeping on even in the face of persecution. How be to God that was that way here in the United States of America. Can I hear an amen? As we read the word of God, as they do in India, it would be the case. The power of scripture is that it gives us the ability to go on even in the face yeah, of persecution. I came back in, I think I mentioned this earlier, but I'll mention again that when I came back into the States, I had a text from a friend, and he said, aren't you glad to be back in America? I said, physically, yes. But spiritually, what I learned in Israel, or uh, India, has a lot for us to learn today. What's it going to take for the church to get back to the Word of God? What's it going to take for us to get to read that which is written for our learning and then apply it to our lives? What is it going to take? Persecution? Famine? Pestilence? What? Let's not wait. Let's get into the Word of God and learn what it has for us that we might live to please God and know the joy of the Lord which is our strength. Can I hear an amen to that? Oh, indeed. Let's live it. You see the purpose of the scripture, the power of the scripture, but what's the promise of the scripture? Look again at verse 4 of Romans 15. It says, For whatsoever things were written the fourth time were written for our learning, that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have what? Hope. What? Hope. 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 Now the word hope there doesn't mean, well, I just hope something happens. But the word hope here, as is the case in most of the... Uh, renderings in the New Testament is a Greek word that means confident expectation. Confident expectation. And what that teaches us is that through the Scripture, we have the confident expectation, the assurance of God's daily care. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. You know, he just got, talking, got finished talking about uh, the provision of food, clothing, and shelter. And he says, keep your eyes focused on God and he will take care of all the other needs that you have. We have the assurance of that if we just trust God. And then through the scripture, we have the assurance, that is the confident expectation of God's daily direction. You know what Psalm 48, 14 says? In, in case you don't know what it says, I'll tell you. It says this, and talks about God. It says, this God of ours will guide us clear unto death. Isn't it great to know that there's not a day, there's not a moment, there's not an hour, there's not a second, that God is not guiding us if we will allow Him to do so and yield to His leadership in our lives. We have that that confident expectation that he will lead us. And then uh, through the scripture, we have the assurance, that is, the confident expectation of God's eternal plan. The other day I was reading Revelation chapter 21 and 22, what the new heaven and new earth is going to be all about. No more pain. Oh, thank the Lord. No more carpal tunnels and pains in the neck and out of joint discs. Woo! Come on, you Baptists. Either some of you don't have any pain or you're not hearing me. 
Think about it. When we get to heaven, God is going to wipe all the tears from our eyes because that which brings sorrow and agony in this life will be, be gone. And folks, that's not just a pipe dream. It is a reality. The reality of the blessed hope that is the assurance, the confident expectation that one of these days we will see Jesus and it will be worth it all when we see Christ. All trials will seem so small when we see Him face to face. Are you ready to go? Some of you need to be waking up first. Some of you will miss the rapture. Not because you're unsaved, but because you'd rather sleep through it. No, you won't. Thank God for that. When the rapture happens, we'll all be wakened up, won't we? But that, you see, is the promise of Scripture. Think of this verse. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, that is, in the Old Testament and New Testament, was written for our learning, my learning, your learning, that we, together, through the patience, that is, the endurance and the comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Does that excite you this morning, church? Does that waken you up? Well, what are you going to do about it? Hmm, didn't think about that. Well, think about this. God loves us so much that he has given us the scriptures so that we can learn about him and his great works. Isn't that great? Did you, somebody, you all, most of you didn't hear me, did you? God loves us so much. That he has given the scriptures so that we can learn about him and his great works. If we're not in this book, we'll never learn those things. That's why sometimes we go around being dull people. We don't see the excitement of what God's doing through his word. But in order to learn about him and his great works, we must be in the scriptures three ways. Number one, daily. Daily. That means on a regular basis. Number two, diligently. That means with earnest and serious Bible study. And number three, deeply. That means digging into the depths of the scripture as we grow. All these things were written for our learning. That we might know who God is, what God has planned for us, how God's at work. But we must be daily in the word of God. We must be diligently studying the word of God. We must be digging deeply into the word of God. And then, and then... That light bulb is going to come on in our heads. When we don't know where to go, what to do, or what to think, boom, that light bulb comes on and it says, but look what God has for you. Look, look what God has for you. You, me, us. It's found in the Word of God. I began with Dr. J. Verda McGee's statement of many years ago. I want to come to a conclusion with it. The greatest sin of the church of Jesus Christ is ignorance of the Word of God. He says, many times I will hear a church officer say, I don't know much about the Bible, but my opinion is... And then he gives his opinion, which actually contradicts the word of God. We don't need to live on opinions. We can live on the truth of God's word, but we need to get to know it. God has given the world, the church, the Christian, you and me, the scriptures, for our learning that we might learn great truths about who he is and what he expects and what he has for us. Are we learning from his word today? Oh, I trust that we are. Because we remember as we get in the word of God, it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. All of these things, all of this book is written that we might have the expectation of the certain work of God on our behalf. Praise God. Let's get into the word of God. If you don't know Christ as Savior, call upon his name and ask him to save you. And then as a Christian, get into God's word and watch him work in your life. Let's stand for prayer. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that you will take it and use it in our lives today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Number 301 is what we're going to conclude with. Only trust him. This altar is open. If you'd like to come for prayer to receive Christ as Savior or for, for some other reason, please do as we sing number 301. participation in our worldwide broadcast of the Hour of Faith, which originated from the sanctuary of the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. Dr. Gary G. Dole and the Family of Faith welcomes you to Sunday School at 9.30, morning worship at 